Could there be life on the moon? Where are the plumes in Enceladus coming from? And are we building a telescope that will directly image an Earth sized planet orbiting a sun like star? All this and more in this week's question show. Welcome to the question show your questions, my answers as always wherever you are across my channel, the question pops in your brain, just write it down, I will gather them up and I will answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. Adam Matheson 5119. Have we actually ruled out life on the moon? I mean, the surface is dead, but is it so on Mars? So like the easy answer to this question is that there's no life on the moon. Come on, it's airless. The temperatures range by 250 degrees Celsius between the nighttime and the daytime. It's blasted by radiation. There's no water on the moon. How could there be life on the moon? Well, of course, people thought about ways that there might be life on the moon. So I'm going to start with the life that we are almost certain is on the moon, and that is tardigrades. So when Israel attempted the landing with its bare sheet lander, it had on board some astronauts and these were tardigrades water bears. And as we all know, they are incredibly tough. And it's believed that based on the velocity that the bare sheet lander struck the moon, that they survived the impact and water bears can hibernate, they can handle being in the vacuum of space. They're crazy. So almost certainly there are viable water bears on the surface of the moon. They just need just a little bit of air pressure, a little bit of water, and they will conquer the moon. So we're pretty sure that there are tardigrades on the moon. The second thing is that all of the Earth based spacecraft that have gone to the moon, despite how well they've been cleaned, and when they're going to the moon, not very well, um, you know, not very carefully, because it's the moon is airless, and how could there be life on the moon? So don't worry about it. And so people don't do a very diligent job of removing the Earth based bacteria. But there's a series of experiments that are going on with the International Space Station where they're finding that life can just handle being in space itself, like there are certain kinds of bacteria, archaea, fungi, various life forms that can be exposed to the vacuum of space, the temperature changes, the radiation, all of that. And then when you bring them back to Earth like conditions, they're able to thrive. And so almost certainly there is viable bacteria on the exterior surfaces of all of Earth based spacecraft. Now, one sort of interesting idea about this is that we know that we are going to be starting to explore the south pole of the moon when the Artemis three mission goes to the moon, it's going to be looking at the permanently shadow craters on the moon, there is deposits of water ice there. You've got water, you've got bacteria that thrives once it gets some water, could they come back to life in that situation? Probably not. But but you never know. And then another idea um, is that there could still be life underground on the moon. And so when we think about the Earth, as deep as we have been able to drill on Earth, we have found life that there is hot water vents under the ground across planet Earth. And in those watery areas, life continues to go on. It's powered by the heat of the Earth. It's able to provide get the nutrients that it requires, and it just keeps going. And there are like some estimates that there's more biosphere under the surface of the Earth than there is on the top of the Earth, which is kind of weird. And so in fact, the life on Earth is not the trees and the fish and us. But in fact, it is just this enormous 10 kilometer belt of bacteria and archaea and other extreme life forms that are underground. And so you could theoretically have those kinds of conditions on places like the moon and even on Mars where you have yeah, on the surface, forget about it. But if you get down under the surface, the temperature is going to raise up, there could be deposits of liquid water, they're kept under pressure because they're in lava tube chambers, things like that. And there was a paper um, that came out fairly recently uh, by uh, Manasavi Lingham. And I just interviewed Manasavi and I and I really tried to make it clear to you that he has written just an enormous, fascinating collection of papers. And this is one of them where he's like, what is the potential for liquid water biochemistry deep underground on the moon and Mars and places like that? And what is that? What implications does it have for rogue planets and other things? So Again, you know, Google his name, 
go to his Google Scholar page, look through the papers, they're readable, and they will blow your mind. And it was a pleasure to talk to Mansabi about about Enceladus, but he's just he's he's worked on everything, every crazy idea. So anyway, he has actually done the math with uh, Abby Loeb, they did the math on what are the possibilities of life on a completely rocky world like Mercury, or the moon and, and based on their calculations, the answer is, you know, there is a possibility of it. So, so yeah, almost certainly the surface of the moon is lifeless. But there could well be life underground on the moon. And we found chunks of the Earth on the moon, we found chunks of the moon on the Earth. And so it's almost certain that material has been shared back and forth between the Earth and the moon. And that's the way that life could find its way to the moon. So it's a really exciting idea. And how do we test this, right? We have to drill, we have to take deep core samples, go down kilometers below the surface on the moon, and who knows what we might find. I'm sure you've noticed the Star Trek planet name that has appeared above my shoulder. And this is a way for you to vote for you to tell us what you thought was the best question answer, or the most interesting or the best answer for me to a snarky question, who knows who cares, whatever was the best uh, vote. And so what we do is we count up all of the planet names that you post in the comments down below, and then we celebrate the winner. And last week's winner was wondering if we could enclose the sun in some sort of green filter to be able to see, uh, make it look like a green star, which would be weird. So congratulations to HPA 97. Thanks, everybody who voted. Uh, we'll put a list of all of the planet names down in the show notes as well as sort of for the titles along the top and just put a planet name into the comments down below and we'll count them up. Zhao de Carvalho 7012. How are they supposed to put a 14 meter mirror in space? So this question comes from last week's Space Bites where I talked about the Saltus telescope, a 14 meter far infrared telescope that had been proposed by some researchers. And this is like right at the very beginning, this was like the first time that I had ever seen that telescope concept proposed. And so the way this process works is that someone makes a proposal on a telescope, then later on, it might get picked up as part of NASA's consideration of future great mission observatories, then you get the decadal survey where astronomers come together and they decide on what their priorities are. And then this proposal, so we could be 20 years away from when this telescope is proposed to when it actually launches if it ever launches, and it's almost certain that it won't launch like these, I these are the ideas that people are kicking around. And then it's just a matter of time as they winnow them down. And do you remember Louvoir, the large ultraviolet infrared observatory? You know, that that was potentially a 15 meter telescope. And now at this point, it looks like Louvoir is going to be a 6.5 meter telescope, the same size as James Webb. So you know, we're not going to have this gigantic telescope. But when astronomers were proposing the Louvoir telescope, this was going to be the follow on to the Hubble Space Telescope, it was going to be a 15 meter primary mirror. So even bigger than this Salsa telescope that I was talking about. So their proposal for the 15 meter version of the Louvoir was to launch it on a space launch system. And that is probably the only rocket right now that is capable of launching that kind of a payload, it would be a very large fairing that would then hold this 15 meter telescope inside of it. And then just like with James Webb, once it reached space, it would then unfold out of the fairing and it would be 15 meters across with the primary mirror and then it would have an even larger sunshade that would go beneath it. But now we know that that's not going to happen. So the simple answer is how do you launch a 14 meter telescope, you know, the same way you're going to do a 15 meter, which is on space launch system, but the space launch systems are going to be launching Artemis missions. So then there's Starship, which is going to absolutely be capable of deploying a 14 meter telescope, and even bigger, you know, it's going to have a gigantic fairing. So in, you know, right now, who knows whether Starship will eventually become a fully reusable two stage rocket, but even in a fully disposable way, you could launch the biggest telescopes ever launched into space, and then you just destroy all of Starship. And yeah, that's sad. But boy, you got the biggest telescope into space. The other idea, and this is the one that I really like, 
is that you do on orbit construction. So instead of trying to launch this gigantic 14 meter telescope in one go, you launch it in bits and pieces. So you launch the main bus, which is like this, the central intelligence of the telescope with robotic arms, and then you launch other components, you launch its solar wings, you launch its primary mirror, maybe in hexagons, the way James Webb works, and then it, it grabs all the bits and pieces as they're coming in and connects them all together and it builds the telescope. This has been proposed in NASA for several years now. And you know, we saw with the International Space Station that you can build a vehicle in space that can perform these kinds of functions bit by bit by bit. And so building a telescope in space would be a, like a smaller version of building the International Space Station. And then once you did that, then you could fly up to it, you could refurbish it, you could swap out pieces, you know, it would be designed to be extended. So I think that you know, one of the next big accomplishments, one of the next big telescopes that's going to be built, they're going to really consider on orbit assembly of the telescope. Agent Dark Bute, why do the plumes of Enceladus exist in the first place? Is it that the ocean is both under high pressure from ice, but also places open to the vacuum, which causes it to boil? Scientists aren't 100% sure why Enceladus has these tiger stripes at the South Pole that are venting water vapor into space. Now we look at the worlds around Jupiter, we look at Io and Europa and Callisto and Ganymede. And as you get really close to Jupiter, the incredible tidal forces, these interactions between the moon and Jupiter's gravity and the other moons in the system cause this flexing that happens to the world. And so with Io, because it's the closest to Jupiter it experiences the most, and its surface is covered in lava, it has the largest eruptions, the most eruptions in the entire solar system. And then as you get one world away, then you get to Europa and Europa is farther and it doesn't experience the same level. But clearly, there's some kind of subsurface ocean. So the flexing is going on underneath the moon. Um, and that's causing this melting to have liquid water underneath the surface of this thick shell of ice. And then it's probably the same on Callisto, and it's probably the same at Ganymede. But astronomers are finding these ice worlds across the solar system and places where they don't have that same level of tidal flexing. So for example, we know that there's going to be a subsurface ocean at Pluto, there's probably a subsurface ocean at Eris at Maki Maki, like all of the dwarf planets probably have subsurface oceans, Ceres probably has a subsurface ocean. As soon as you get a large world that has a large amount of water ice, you're probably going to get a subsurface ocean. And what is the source? So one contributor is this tidal interaction between the planet or if it has a large moon, the interactions between that. Another possibility is that you've got radioactive elements in the crust in the rocky parts of this world, and they are releasing heat that is liquefying the water and allowing for the subsurface ocean. So what is the cause of the one on Enceladus? So there's really there's like two possibilities that have been proposed by scientists right now. One is that the tiger stripe cracks are direct vents between the subsurface ocean and space that literally there are cracks fissures that have opened up at the bottom of Enceladus that connect the ocean to space and water is percolating seeping out of the ocean and reaching the out through the cracks and venting off into space. It's a lot of water that is making its way out into space. But the other possibility is that the water source for these geysers is actually much closer to the surface that there could be slushy regions under the South Pole of Enceladus where this water is coming from and it has nothing to do with the ocean that it's going to be beneath tens of kilometers of, of water ice. And the way to figure out which one it is, is to send a mission to Enceladus, we need a probe to be able to fly through those plumes and to sample taste the water that is coming out of Enceladus. And by doing that, they'll know, okay, we are we are detecting the kind of chemistry that you would get from water that was interacting with a solid, rocky, 
core, or we're detecting water that has been generated, you know, that, that hasn't reached hasn't been enriched by those kinds of minerals. Instead, it's just coming from the water, which is really close to the surface. So it's an unanswered question in planetary science right now. And it's one of the great reasons why uh, people really want to send a mission to Enceladus, we have to go back. Quick cat 21 MK. Is there a telescope that will direct image a planet in the works? There are several telescopes that can directly image planets right now, they don't need to be in the works. They are telescopes like the Hubble Space Telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope, and then ground based telescopes like the Keck Observatory, the Subaru Observatory, the Very Large Telescope, there have been plenty of images, direct images of exoplanets that have been captured. Uh, I've shared them in various news stories. Uh, and we have been watching these in some cases for almost 20 years, there are animations that you can see of of planets orbiting around stars where you've got 20 years of observations and you can just see the planet going around the star. And it's not like it's a simulation. It's not like it's a estimate like you're literally watching a planet as it in, in orbit around a star. But I don't think that's the question you asked, right? I think the question that you ask is, is, is there a telescope in the works that will directly image an Earth sized world orbiting around a sun like star? And that is a tall order that is different. The worlds that I talked about, these are Jupiter sized worlds orbiting around a sun like star at just enormous distances away from the star. And so you can actually pick them out. So we do not have any telescopes that are capable of doing that. But there are a couple of telescopes that are in the works right now that should bring that capability online. So the first one, and this isn't going to do it is the Roman Space Telescope. And this is going to be launching in a couple of years 2027. And this is going to have a chronograph on board. This is the instrument that blocks the light from the star and allows you to see fainter objects that are nearby. And it's going to be capable of resolving Jupiter sized worlds around sun like stars at the orbit of Jupiter. In other words, it's going to see exo Jupiters directly image them and be able to take pictures of them in addition to all of its other science work. So that's great. The other telescope that will probably be able to pull this off is the extremely large telescope. And this is the upcoming telescope that's being built by the European Southern Observatory. It's a 39 meter telescope, and it's probably going to become operational again, probably 2027, maybe 2028. 39 meter telescope. And one of its capabilities, if you push the very limits of this telescope, is it should be capable of resolving Earth sized world orbiting around sun like stars in our near vicinity. So that's probably going to be the first telescope that will be able to pull that off. Now, there is a telescope that is being planned right now and custom built, where its only job is to observe Earth sized worlds orbiting around sun like stars, I guess it's not being built, sorry, it's there's a telescope that's being planned. And that is the habitable worlds observatory. And so you know, early on the show, I talked about the Louvoir telescope, the Louvoir telescope has been morphed into the habitable worlds observatory. And this is going to be a James Webb sized primary mirror, so probably a 6.5 meter mirror. But it's going to be viewing in the near infrared visible light ultraviolet. So kind of like what Hubble does. And it's going to have a chronograph on board that is so good that it will allow to block the light from the star and be able to see Earth sized worlds orbiting around it. And so the work that's being done with the Roman Space Telescope is to test out some of these technologies, and then they can push it to the next level and be able to actually see that Earth sized world. So we are probably five years away from the first telescope capable of actually imaging an Earth sized world orbiting around a sun like star. And we are probably about 20 years away from it being a thing that we do all the time. Mr. Mark Meadowland, considering that L4 and L5 are stable, if you had a body there, would there be new points of stability around them? I just can't resist a Lagrange point question. Um, so yes, the Lagrange points, these are the five relatively stable points that are in orbit around two objects. So you have the Earth and the Sun, a, a extremely massive object, the sun, a much less massive object, the Earth, and that generates these five Lagrange points, the three that are lined up l one, two, and three, they are meta unstable, which means that if you put a mass of negligible size 
in one of those regions, it requires very little fuel to maintain that position. But eventually, if you don't have fuel on board, the thing is going to drift away. But then there is the L4 and the L5, also known as the Trojan regions. And these are ahead and behind at 60 degrees in the orbit of the world. And those are metastable. In other words, if you drop a mass, a negligible mass compared to the mass of the of the sun and the earth, then it will hang out there and be able to um, sort of just float around and not, you know, continue on its orbit, not drift away, it's sort of stuck there, and you don't need any more fuel. But you're asking, if you put something into the L4 or the L5 point, would you then create new points of stability. And the key to this whole thing is that you need to have the, the L4 and the L5 point will only support masses that are negligible compared to the mass of the two objects. In other words, you've got the mass of the sun, you've got the mass of Earth and in Earth's Lagrange points L4 and L5 point, it can support objects that are a couple of kilometers across. So asteroids, small asteroids, Jupiter is more massive. And so it can support larger asteroids, things are in the tens of kilometers across. But once you get too massive, then it can no longer be held in the Lagrange point, it's going to drift away. So if you put a asteroid that is two kilometers across into the Lagrange point around the, you know, the Earth Sun L4 Lagrange point, um, you could put a moon around it. But is it really? Has it created a new point of stability? Not really. So unfortunately, you know, because you can only hold objects of negligible mass compared to the rest, then you kind of don't have a lot of options to try and create more Lagrange points within that region. Every time we do the question show, I let you know about our Patreon support. And this is a way for you to support the work we do at Universe Today. But did you know that you can join our Patreon for free? No money. And what you can do is go to Patreon, follow us on Patreon for free, and you will get access to all of the stuff that we publicly post on Patreon. And sometimes it's done simultaneously with the stuff that the members get. In some cases, it may come a day or two later, but you will get a notification and you didn't have to pay any money. And it's, of course, a way that you can keep an eye on what we do on Patreon. And then if you want, you can switch over to become a paid patron and you get even additional content. But still, it's a good first step. So go to patreon.com slash universe today. And I want to celebrate a bunch of our subscribers. So thanks to Richard DeRocco, Paul Robach, Dr. Gary Pamplin, Jeff Williams, Richard Drum, Chris Nealon, Patrick Smith, Eto Perinka, aka Kate, Kagasi, Jeff Shores, Larry Drozd, and Michael Goebel. Join the club at patreon.com slash universe today. Tinkle Tink, is it possible to grind your own glass for a Dobsonian telescope? Absolutely. Uh, and many people who build their own telescopes will go through this process of grinding their own glass. And if you want to decrease the price on your telescope, getting a sort of blank telescope glass is a good first step, because then you don't need something that has been sort of engineered to create this perfect shape, you don't need to have it be polished and anodized or any of that you just need a chunk of high quality glass, and then you get to do the grinding. But I have talked to people who have done this, and they said, don't do it. It's so much work. It is days and days and weeks of work, you get essentially you get this this glass disc, like a great big glass hockey puck. And then you have to grind the glass, you have to down to get this the shape that you're looking for for your telescope. And you get a you can get a like a like a form I'm trying to think what what it's called like a template that you can then put you can put inside the, the glass as you're as you're grinding it down, and then just make sure to see that it that it fits. And a lot of people they just do this by hand, like you take sandpaper, you hold the glass and you just start to sand away to push away the the center. And eventually, as you check your form, and then you just keep grinding away, you'll get this perfect shape that you want. And that and that definitely knocks off some money off the price. But you can also just go and buy a lens that has already been ground by a machine somewhere in China. And 
you know, in many cases, the that part is the most complicated and time consuming part. And so you can spend say $100 and get a pre ground mirror, and then you can get it silvered. And you can get the secondary mirror silvered, and then you can build all of the other parts of your Dobsonian telescope, the, you know, the tube and the mount, and you can get your IP set up and all that kind of stuff. And that is, you know, not as much pain to do. So yes, you can. And many people have done it. Um, and if you want, like, you know, if you want to spend some time working on something that's very delicate and very time consuming and requires a lot of concentration, by all means, give it a shot. But for the people I've talked to, it sounds like a lot of work. Galaxy A40s, how much mass does Earth gain from space and how much does it lose per year on average? Yeah, so you think the Earth is just the mass that it is left over from the solar system. But when you think about meteorites that are lighting up the sky here on Earth, the Earth is gaining mass, that there is dust from space that is raining down on the planet. And it, it's interesting. So I did an, an interview uh, about six months ago with a researcher who was thinking about this dust that is just constantly raining down on planet Earth. And that this is like a background source of nutrients for life on Earth that even if Earth is completely covered in glaciers, then this dust is still going to be raining down covering the top of the glaciers. And you could have these pools of water where you've got these these minerals that are seeding it with other with elements that life can use to get going. So it's pretty cool that this dust is happening, you can collect dust off of the your roof, you can, you know, use a magnet and go through the material that's found in the gutter of your roof. And you're going to get little metallic stuff stuck to your magnet. Now most of that is going to be industrial pollution. But some of it is going to be metallic meteorites that have dropped from space landed on your roof. And now you can look at them, you get a microscope, you can look through these, and you can tell you start to sort them and you're like, Oh, no, that's coal dust. That is, you know, some other pollution. And then you see little pieces that are little pieces of space metal that have landed on your roof. And in fact, like really old roofs, like, like old um, churches and stuff that have been around for hundreds of years, there's a real opportunity to go onto those roofs, bring a magnet across and try to collect as much space dust as you can. Because in fact, there's scientific study that can be done to see how those numbers are changing. So on average, the Earth gains about 40,000 tons to its mass from all of this cosmic dust that is raining down onto the planet. So it's about 100 tons a day. But the Earth is also losing its atmosphere to space. So we've got the solar wind that is interacting with the planet. And we've got just sort of the bubbling off of some of our atmosphere into space and the Earth loses about twice as much mass in terms of atmosphere as it gains in terms of space dust. And so in fact, the Earth is losing is losing mass overall. And it is gaining cosmic dust on the surface and it, the atmosphere is bleeding off into space. But don't panic. Um, the Earth has tons and tons and tons, literally tons of atmosphere. And so we will not lose any appreciable amount of our atmosphere over the lifetime of the sun. But it's pretty cool that this process is happening. DJ Alexander, how much does it cost scientists to book time with telescopes such as James Webb? Using James Webb is completely free. Using the Hubble Space Telescope is completely free. Most of the all of the space telescopes, all of the observatories are free to use, you don't have to pay to use them. But the trick is that you have to apply you have to make the science case that the science that you want to do with the telescope is worth doing. And then they'll put you into the calendar, and you'll be able to make those observations. So no, you don't have to pay anything to use these telescopes. Busy Billy B33. Could Earth remain habitable beyond 500 million years if future civilizations develop a sun shield to protect from the sun's growing power output? Yeah, so when we talk about the lifetime of the sun, how the sun probably has like another 7 billion years in it before it bloats up as a red giant and gobbles up the inner planets. You know, we think about that as the time when you know, that's how many billion years we have left for life to be on Earth. But the reality is, is that the sun is increasing its output, its 
increasing its overall luminosity. And that is because essentially its core is growing, it's getting more and more helium building up in its core. And it's actually starting to release more and more energy. And this process is going to keep going. And it'll be pretty bad in about 500 million years from now. Like that's the point when temperatures on Earth will be so hot that the oceans will start to boil. And then, you know, life on Earth is going to have a really hard time. And it's interesting, you know, we think about multicellular animals, we have been around for about 500 million years. Like before that, you had single cell organisms. And then at about 500 million years ago, we got these multicellular organisms. Here we are right smack in the middle. We have another 500 million years to go before the temperatures on the planet really don't support the existence of multicellular organisms that things are going to devolve not devolve exactly, but essentially, you're going to end up with those single celled organisms, those bacteria hiding underground in those pockets of water that I mentioned early on in the episode. And so obviously, 500 million years, like, that's that's just right around the corner. We don't, we don't have time. What are we going to do about this? Um, and so you know, I've mentioned many times in previous episodes that one way that we can solve this is that we just move the Earth farther away from the sun and we use the gravity of an asteroid to make close flybys to gravitational slingshots. And we slowly drift the Earth farther and farther away from the sun to match the increasing output that's coming from the sun. But the other way that you could do it, and you're exactly right, is that you block some of the illumination that is coming from the sun. So you would put some kind of of large satellite at the Earth Sun L1 Lagrange point, that's the point that's in between the sun and the Earth. And if you made it big enough, then the Earth would fall under the shadow of this satellite. And it doesn't have to necessarily be one satellite, there have been proposals that you could inflate giant balls of mylar, and they would just sort of float around in this L1 point, and they would block some of the light coming from the sun. But the problem is the L1 point is meta unstable. And so whatever you put at that position needs some kind of propulsion to be able to remain in that position. So it's just a matter of time before it starts to drift away, and you have to put it back into place and it also has to be big, like you're going to need something that is very large to be able to cast a shadow. Now it doesn't have to be complete, right. And over time, you can just keep adding to the station as more and more illumination is coming from the sun to block more of the light on Earth. So it, you know, who knows which of these mega engineering projects is going to be the one that buys us more time that gives us the billions of years instead of the hundreds of millions of years that we have left on planet Earth. But it is funny to think about how, you know, we human beings are incredibly short lived compared to the age of the Earth, the age of the universe. And yet, we feel this sort of emotional distress thinking about a time 500 million years from now, like 500 million years ago, multicellular organisms just got started, there were worms. And, you know, what's going to be like that far into the future. And yet, you know, when you think about dark energy, maybe ripping the universe apart, and we only have 13 billion years left instead of the 10 to the power of 100 years that we thought it's like, Oh, I need more time. Ryan Graver, does Hawking radiation travel faster than light? One of the most interesting ideas that Stephen Hawking contributed was the idea that black holes can evaporate over time. And I've sort of gone into the process in previous question shows. So I won't sort of go into it. But essentially, over time, you get particles that are emanating from black holes, and the mass is coming from the black hole, and the black hole shrinks as it produces more of these particles. Now, the vast majority of the particles the black holes are going to be producing are going to be photons and photons travel at the speed of light. So Hawking radiation mostly travels at the speed of light. But if a different kind of particle is released, maybe an atom of hydrogen, something like that, then they can't travel the speed of light, they have to travel slower than the speed of light. I don't know what the speed of them is going to be, they have to have gotten away from the black hole. So they had to be going fast. But I but and they can't go the speed of light. So they would have to be going somewhere in between fast enough to escape from just outside the event horizon of the black hole, but not so fast that they exceed the speed of light. Leo Shimra, did JWST just find a Dyson sphere? 
This is a piece of news that's been going around on the internet. And of course, we reported on it on Universe Today like a couple of weeks ago. I saw it in the archive and I was like, hmm, Dyson Spheres. Yeah, we totally are going to cover that. And the gist is that SETI researchers were looking through an enormous catalog of stars. And they were looking for examples of stars that were shining in the infrared as opposed to shining in the visible light. Normally, you would expect stars to be releasing most of their energy in visible light, ultraviolet, some in infrared, but you're not going to get large amounts in infrared. And they found seven candidates that they thought were the kind of thing you would expect to get from a Dyson sphere. And also explain here why you would expect to see infrared light coming from a Dyson sphere. So a Dyson sphere, right, this is this proposed mega structure that you would surround a star with and you would collect all of the energy that is coming from the star. Now it wouldn't necessarily be a rigid object, it could just be a giant cloud of satellites that are orbiting around the star. But from an outside observer, every single photon that is coming from the star is being intercepted by one of these satellites then used for some purpose. And because you are stopping the visible light, then these satellites are going to heat up. And so they have to then give off this heat in the form of infrared radiation. And so you'd be looking for these stars that are just giving off infrared radiation, but not giving off visible light, that would be super weird. And so astronomers have been looking for for examples of these. And so they think they found seven of them. Very cool. However, you know, what are the chances that this is actually alien civilizations that have enclosed their stars? Probably pretty low. And there are plenty of other examples that can explain this. So there's a kind of astronomical object called a dust obscured galaxy. And this is a quasar that is incredibly far away. It is billions of light years away. And it is producing enormous amounts of radiation. But this radiation is sort of going up against these huge clouds of gas and dust that are surrounding the quasar itself. So maybe it crunched up a bunch of stars. And now you've got all this dust debris around the quasar, it's blasting out its radiation, but instead of it sort of arriving directly to us, it's having to go through this dust first, it's heating the dust up, it's releasing infrared radiation, it's sort of the exact same thing with the Dyson sphere. And so the WISE telescope, NASA's WISE telescope did a survey and found this interesting class of quasars, these dust obscured galaxies, and mapped out a whole bunch of them. And so a team of researchers just a couple of days ago went through a map of these dust obscured galaxies, and they found that a bunch of them are surprisingly close in position to where these Dyson spheres are. And they proposed that in fact, you can perfectly explain what are these seem to be infrared stars that in fact, they're not infrared stars at all, they are quasars that are shining in the infrared. And so, you know, I'm sure there are plenty of other examples that can try to explain these things. But like, I just want to make it absolutely clear that I think we should absolutely be looking for Dyson spheres. And I think this is great and very clever and very cool. And we should be looking for every possible signal for uh, alien intelligence that we can and you know, not just Dyson spheres, what about Dyson galaxies? What about type three civilizations, ones that have enclosed every single star in their entire galaxy in Dyson spheres? Now, of course, these dust obscure galaxies would give off that same signal as an entire galaxy that is surrounded by infrared radiation. But maybe if it's close enough, we can actually see the shape of the galaxy and see how it's releasing infrared radiation, and yet it still has a galactic spiral. So, so keep looking. But don't, don't assume that this was a slam dunk case of, of Dyson spheres. This is just like one interesting possible candidate. Jaden Light Knight, how do I stay up to date with stuff about space without getting overwhelmed by the info, especially as someone who is not normally knowledgeable in these subjects? Thanks. Well, this just seems like a really easy question for me to answer, uh, Jaden, uh, who is definitely a real person. Um, uh, this is my job. My job is to educate you about space and astronomy subjects, both here on the YouTube channel, as well as the podcast that I do. Um, and the other thing that I do is a podcast with Dr. Pamela Gay, who is a professional astronomer. We do a podcast called Astronomy Cast. We're in episode 720. And each episode of Astronomy Cast, we pick a different topic, and then we just cover it soup to nuts in this very conversational style. So uh, we talk about dwarf planets or rogue planets or 
elliptical galaxies or, you know, and you can go through the full list of topics and go, Ooh, I want to listen to your tour through the solar system, or I want to listen to different kinds of propulsion systems and so on. So at this point, we've covered every conceivable topic, and yet we keep coming up with new ideas. Now, of course, I also write a weekly email newsletter, which you can get uh, going to universetoday.com slash newsletter, and you can sign up. And that's just like a just a big list of all of the interesting stories that are happening in space. And it's really kind of a process of osmosis, you have to just immerse yourself in this content over time. And after a while, you know, if you're interested, and you're curious, then the bits and pieces are going to start to make sense. And you'll realize when you, I don't know, you're looking at a newspaper article, and someone says they've detected some new particle, and you're going to look at it and go, Oh, well, how many sigma and then you're like, not enough sigma for me, you know, suddenly you realize that you're very knowledgeable about these various subjects. This stuff is not me. Um, I want to highly recommend crash course astronomy. Uh, Phil plate did an amazing job of sort of a multi part course on space astronomy. It's very much like a course, but you know, it's very accessible. His work is great. I highly recommend listening to Dr. Paul Sutter. He has his ask a spaceman podcast. He's great. Definitely subscribe to a bunch of channels here on YouTube. Uh, there's john Michael Godier who covers a lot of astronomy topics. There's cool world. They're legit. Uh, I really like Angela Collier. I like, uh, man, there's so many. And then of course, I've been sharing different astronomy related YouTube channels. So, you know, as long as you're curious, and as long as you just keep listening, and let your brain start to put the pieces together over time, this stuff that feels overwhelming will start to be whelming and eventually will just make a ton of sense. And in fact, you'll be caught up to speed. And like the rest of us, when you see a news article, you'll know what are the new pieces that are, you know, that you can then assimilate into your knowledge. So enjoy the journey. Um, uh, you know, it beats so many other ways of wasting your time, you know, learning about the universe being curious, uh, very rewarding. So I'm really glad that I can be a part of your journey. But also there's tons and tons of resources out there. So so good luck. All right, those are all the questions that we got this week. Thank everyone who posted your questions into the YouTube comments. I was able to grab a bunch of those and answer them as well as everybody who joined me for the live show. Now the live show is the thing we do every Monday at 5pm Pacific time. It is two hours long. So what you're seeing is edited down from this two hour show. And I try to get a lot more questions answered. I have back and forth with the community. It's a lot of fun. So come join us. There should be an, the next event posted here on the channel. Now I'm going to revisit the book club in a second. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew Gross, David Giltonen, Dennis Alberti, Dustin Cable, Jeremy Matter, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Modso, Paul Rohrbach, Stephen Krasaki, Stephen Fowler Munley, and Vlad Shiplin, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. And all our patrons, all your support means the universe to us. So I've been continuing to read books and people wondered like, what am I reading right now? And so I've gone back to Alistair Reynolds, who has been just my absolute favorite author for the last couple of years. Thanks to readers uh, for Universe Today who recommended in the book club that I check out Alistair Reynolds work. I've now gone through six, seven of his books. Uh, and he's so good. He's he's so creative and has strikes this right balance. Like if you really enjoy the culture series, you really enjoy the Mass Effect series of video games, you know, the Revelation Space books by Alistair Reynolds are incredible. And so now but I'm reading his not Revelation Space books. And the one I'm reading right now is called House of Suns. But it's kind of Revelation Space again, the gist being that it is a advanced civilization from Earth who has cloned themselves, they've moved off across the galaxy. And they are exploring and gathering information and they come together every 10s of 1000s of years for a big meeting where they share all their information. And the main characters of the of the book are late for the meeting. And they're expecting to get chastised. And instead, they're warned to stay away that someone has attempted to kill everybody at the meeting. And so then they are on the run and trying to figure out who did it and try to pull together allies to be able to stop these threats against their civilization. And, you know, again, if you enjoy the culture series, House of Sons is sort of exactly in that same 
realm. So uh, thank you everybody who recommended Alistair Reynolds to me in the past because now I'm just like going through his entire body of work and I, I don't think I'm going to stop. Now, if you want to recommend books to me, we've got a link to our Goodreads community in the show notes down below. You can go there. There's a community you can recommend books and I will read them You know, when I'm not done reading Alistair Reynolds books and uh, let you know what I thought. All right, we'll see you next week.